The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Feel free to have a seat. So grace, peace, and radical love are ours for the sharing. Thanks to the overcoming sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, let us proclaim, Amen. So I try to be thankful when people offer me learning when I don't ask for it or when I'm not looking for it. And um, I made the mistake once, once, of thanking someone for their service around Memorial Day. Mind you, she was a living individual and still serving, I believe. And this strong, auburn-haired, vivacious vocal woman who had previously told me on another occasion when we were together that my face often seemed to communicate that I judge other people, <laughs> was yet again offering me an opportunity to be aware. So needless to say, I paid attention to this lovely individual who I truly, truly love and who I call Mary. Um, and in that exchange, she took the opportunity to help me learn that Memorial Day honors those who have died from which we get the phrase, all gave some and some gave all. And that Veterans Day salutes those who have served. And never really shall the two be crossed or intermingled. So message received, lesson learned. <laughs> I haven't, I try not to make that mistake. Um, but both days, in my honest and humble opinion, do call to mind that both those that have passed and those that are we call veterans, um, uh, the sacrifices. Sacrifices are made by those who serve. So today we are in week three of uh, what I've called our gift season, G-I-F-T, standing for giving in faith together. This is our gift, to give in faith together. And this is a time where we prayerfully consider how our blessings and our commitment anew, how they overflow back into God's world. And each week thus far, I've shared our call to give, as outlined, as written, as named specifically in 2 Corinthians 9. And today I share it from the message translation. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think your giving over and to make up your mind what you will give. And here's the key this week that I like in this translation. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. I am not doing sob stories or arm twisting because God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. And we will wrap up this season next week when we will emphasize the word thanks and do a final, more formal commitment of our pledges. As you feel led and as you've made up in your mind because we've had weeks together to sit with this. So thus far we have considered giving, the giving of our times and our talent and treasures through a variety of lenses. We started from a grounding tradition of love 
And then we included the aspect last week of living and leaving a legacy of love and action. And that love and action looks like practicing and sharing humble, ever-learning, ever-growing service. And we do that in our lifetime and in the beyond. So tradition, legacy, and now today I bring and offer the lens of sacrifice. And we get to do this with ten bridesmaids of all people. How in the world does this story of ten bridesmaids help us consider more deeply this lens of sacrifice? Well, in today's gospel lesson from Matthew, Jesus is again teaching through the tool of a parable. And recall that a parable is a storytelling paradigm that hides, it, it hides, it colludes, it confuses uh, some eternal aspect within a story that in the long run ends up begging more questions than it ultimately gives us answers. So today's parable of ten bridesmaids, five wise and five foolish, and one of the um, commentators that I was, write, was reading in my homework, he called them the five wise and the five morons. <laughs> I was like, ooh, um, that's interesting. And uh, this story is a prime example of this confusing, colluding uh, paradigm of hiding. So just as we think we've arrived at an answer, someone can enter in with a new query that upsets the apple cart, so to speak. So let us dive in. As we observed over the entire month of October and more, Jesus has been in contentious debate with the religious power players of the day, and we took a big sigh of relief that we were able to leave that behind last week because he brought them to wordlessness. Last week's text ended with, and nobody asked him any more questions. So Jesus has ended that conversation and turned to the crowds, to the disciples, to us, to deliver his wisdom on living. And as we heard, uh, basically what he was saying is um, he's affirming a charge to live humbly. And from this humble stance now, Jesus, in this week, next week, in the final week of this year of Matthew, through the voice of Matthew, adds an, an additional dimension of import. It's not only important to live humbly, it's also important to be awake, to be alert. Humble and, and, humble and alert, living and loving is key. And no one, no one, not even the Son, knows the day when he, the Savior, will return to bring that perfect shalom, that perfect wholeness, uh, one way to refer to that return is the second coming. No one knows the time of the second coming. So all should be and all should make ready. And Jesus shares these truths in related parables in the full knowledge that his betrayal and death, that his sacrifice is just hours away. We're in chapter 25 and essentially in chapter 26 is where then we get the end of Jesus' life, his crucifixion, and praise be to God, his resurrection. So once again, Jesus uses the imagery of a wedding, a bridegroom and bridesmaids to highlight the second coming. We have ten bridesmaids who are waiting through the night, we hear. Five take extra oil for their lamps, and the other five take no extra oil. And then we hear that the bridegroom is delayed, but did you also hear that all of the bridesmaids also drift off to sleep? All of the bridesmaids. None of them remain awake or alert. So then the bridegroom's coming is soon, and then before they know it is at hand. Look, he's coming. And that warrants them all to wake up and have light to find their way to meet him. So the bridegroom arrives at midnight. All is dark. And the need for oil seems central. Central and pinnacle above all else. In this scenario, a choice seems to be at hand. Will all have what they need to find the bridegroom? Who has been wise and who has been moronic? Is it, nat it is natural to ask, which one am I? Or so it seems. 
Here is where the scenario can invite us to diverging conclusions that seem, in my humble opinion, to beg more questions. The parable notes that five keep the extra oil that they have, and that they successfully enter the banquet, while five are caught making an extra trip to the oil dealer, which, as we noted funnily in, um, in Sunday school, what kind of oil dealers are open at midnight? The 7-Eleven kind? The sketchy kind. <laughs> and they eventually get locked out or unknown and unacknowledged. Now it may seem, and this is kind of where our conversation started uh, in Sunday school, it may seem a pretty clear-cut example that the wise, the sensible, are praised and rewarded. And uh, the, the reference that I didn't bring to mind but immediately was like, ah, yes, the, the airplane one, right? Take care of yourself, put the mask on yourself before helping those with you. That the wise, the sensible, are praised and rewarded, and that the foolish, the immature, are ridiculed and damned. That's the first place I think we can go to. And it's a viable, reasonable, as I said, sensible uh, place to end. But if one has been listening to Jesus, following Jesus, does this clear cut, I'm in, you're out, resonate with who we know Jesus to be? Does it resonate with practicing and sharing of humble, ever-learning service? Does it ring true that God, that Jesus, is looking to catch, that God is looking to trip up people at their lowest, most vulnerable moment? I would unequivocally say no. I don't think it rings true. I believe that Jesus' ministry clearly demonstrates that Jesus has preferential treatment love, compassion, and forgiveness for just such people. That Jesus goes above and beyond to include them, not to exclude them. So I would argue, and you'll have to come back next week to hear another parable that bears this out, the parable of the talents, that the bridesmaid's parable can not only not this is the right answer, but it can make us stop and say, and we also talked about this in Sunday school, now wait just a minute. That's not right, fair, just, or in God's nature. Now wait a minute. Because recall, if you listen to the language, the kingdom of heaven will be like. And Jesus is talking to us and the disciples while the Pharisees are still in the background. Those that are like, we're in, they're out. Jesus is still communicating. This is what you think it will be like. But maybe you need to take another minute and think about it. Because God is love. God finds a way. God is always making things new. So please hear, beloved, I believe, affirm, and trust that it is good it is right and it is just to ask, wasn't there a way, another way to share? Wasn't there another way? And the other way is what Jesus will get to soon after this parable and our parable of next week. Because right after these two parables, Jesus gets to the ultimate love, the ultimate legacy that is the crux of our faith, which is his sacrifice his death, and his resurrection. We have a God that is willing to sacrifice for us. We have a God that embraces radical, sacrificial love. And I believe we can ask the question and imagine another ending, asking what would have happened if the five haves shared with the five have-nots, or if the five haves had shared the light of their individual lamps with the have-nots, that each one lamp maybe had enough light for the two of them, if you stood close enough together, maybe. And isn't this the truth of most of the encounters that we've seen Jesus have with other have-nots in the Bible? Our God is a God of abundance, not a God of a zero-sum game of scarcity, where maybe your gain means that it's my loss, end of story, God, through Jesus, turns this upside down so that your loss means my loss, your gain means my gain. And we hear this in 1 Corinthians 12. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. 
I believe it is a faithful read and a challenge of this text, the bridesmaids text, to question there being another more radical sharing giving way. The five having bridesmaids were reasonable. Don't hear me say that reasonable is not a good thing. It's, again, that good Lutheran both and. Be reasonable and also open yourself up that there could be some radical, sacrificial ways forward as well. That we, as followers of Jesus, have this choice in our living, in our loving, and in our giving. Uh, I was blessed to um, go to... uh, Trinity Lutheran Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, with theologian Mark Allen Powell, who wrote this book, Giving to God, the Bible's Good News About Living a Generous Life. And in this, as I was doing my homework in regard to what do I do with this word sacrifice, he said the good news of stewardship is found in the arena of sacrificial giving. It is in the move from reasonable to radical that the goodness of God takes hold of our lives and transforms us. It is in the move from reasonable, which is a good thing, to radical, which is a possible thing, that the goodness of God takes hold of our lives and transforms us. And it's important to hear that I'm not saying that that money should all come to the church because Powell goes on to say where we give our money Where we give our money is actually less important than the mere fact that we give it. So this is not your pastor asking you to give to a budget or a salary. This is a pastor who sees a God who is abundant, who's transformationally give to us, and a God who wants the same for us. As I've also shared each week from 2 Corinthians 9, it goes on to, con- to affirm that God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share. You may share. You may share abundantly in every good work. So, in closing, could some of the bridesmaids sacrifice? Can we sacrifice? We are blessed to partner with God, and in this, we and the world are transformed. In giving, we are proclaiming that God is good, that God is good, that this God that was willing to sacrifice for us and overcame all things, even death, for us has power and dominion and overflowing abundance to change all of creation. And how amazing is it that God includes us in this? Is there really any greater good news? I don't think so. And I hope and pray that you agree. In Jesus' name, amen.